talking about, and that's only a small part of the system. Uh, things have to be done for the rest of the population, too. They have to be marginalized, but they're not going to be marginalized by uh, telling them uh, lies about foreign policy, because just as you say, they don't believe most of what they read. There's just a kind of a general populist skepticism, along with this sense that the government is run by a few big interests looking out for themselves, is the sense that the media are probably lying to us. Uh, so for most of the population, the media system is, I think, a different one. It's not just the case that it tries to entertain them. It tries to entertain them through means which will intensify attitudes that support the interests of elites. So you want, for example, let me give some cases. Uh, take the emphasis on professional sports. Now, uh, the, it sounds harmless, but it really isn't. Professional sports are a way of building up jingoist fanaticism. Uh, you're supposed to cheer for your own team. I, just to mention something from personal experience, I remember very well myself when I was, I guess, a high school student, sudden revelation, you know, when I asked myself, why am I cheering for my high school football team? <laughs> I don't know anybody on it. If I met anybody on it, I'd we'd probably hate each other. You know, why do I care whether they win or if some guy a couple blocks away wins? Well, you know, uh, and then you could say the same thing about, you know, the baseball team or whatever else it is. Uh, this idea of cheering for your home team, which you mentioned before, that's a way of building into people irrational uh, submissiveness to power, you know. And it's a very dangerous thing. And I think that's one of the reasons it's such a big, it's, it's, it gets such a huge play. Welcome to the Think Twice podcast. I'm Jacob Schreiner Briggs. And I'm Jordan Yule. Before we get to today's guest, we have a couple of preamble items. The first being that we need to shout out Seraphis on SoundCloud. Seraphis is the creator of our introductory music and has been kind enough to let us use it and is uh, going to be a listener to the podcast. So we're excited to be plugging his music and we appreciate his willingness to let us do so and to also follow along with the conversations that we're having. Um, yes, thank you. Thank you, Seraphis. Uh, and second, we, we do want to let the listeners know that we will be releasing some premium content. And Jordan, why don't you uh, tell us a bit about that? Sure. So uh, in the next couple of days, we'll be releasing an episode with Justin Hendricks, executive director of NYU's uh, Media Lab, which is a technology media innovation hub. Uh, they, he works at the crossroads of technology and journalism. So he's going to join us and talk about how Cambridge Analytica, uh, a big data firm that engages in um, emotional and consumer and interest targeting uh, with technology and especially using uh, content that might appeal to people's biases and using that, especially on Facebook, to manipulate, deceive, misinform, uh, and otherwise confuse people, how those types of tools are used in our political system as well as our everyday lives, uh, the ethical complications that come along with that. And we're expecting a really great, relevant discussion, but that will be for Patreon subscribers only. So if you go to patreon.com slash thinktwice, it's only five bucks a month. That's one beer, that's one latte, that's one inflatable raft on one Amazon. One bacon-scented <laughs> air freshener. Yeah, it's $5, and it goes a long way. You will then have access to all of our premium episodes going forward. Uh, and what it will do is uh, support our work and enable us, hopefully, eventually to get a sound engineer <laughs> or someone <laughs> that could help make the sound even better. So think about that. Um, and we, we do hope that you'll consider subscribing. You could also listen to our our free episodes on iTunes, on Google Play, and on SoundCloud if you just search for Think Twice. Follow us on Twitter. Like us on Facebook. Yes, yes. Get connected. So today's guest is Dr. Adam Earnhardt. Adam Earnhardt received his PhD from Kent State in 2007 and is the Chair and Professor of Communication Studies in the Department of Communication at Youngstown State University. 
Earnhardt served as executive director of the Ohio Communication Association and as chair of the National Communication Association's Mass Communication Division. Earnhardt has published several books with other sports and communication scholars, including his most recent work, The ESPN Effect, Exploring the Worldwide Leader in Sports. Dr. Earnhardt has authored or co-authored more than a dozen peer-reviewed journal articles, encyclopedia entries, and book chapters. Earnhardt has served as an expert source on social media, sports and fandom on various television and radio programs, and in several public publications, including Parade Magazine, Psychology Today, Playboy, and several newspapers and magazines, including the Baltimore Sun-Times, Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, Vancouver Magazine, and others. In 2016, Earnhardt received Youngstown State's Diversity Award for Campus Leadership and the Watson Merritt Award for his accomplishments as department chair. He received the National Communication Association Mass Communication Division Service Award in 2015 for his contributions to the field of communication. And in 2011, he was awarded Mentor of the Year for his creation of Rookery Radio, Youngstown State University's first online student-run radio platform. Today, Dr. Earnhardt and the two of us will be discussing the pros and cons of sports fandom and the psychological and sociological underpinnings of that fandom. Please welcome to the podcast, Dr. Adam Earnhardt. Dr. Earnhardt, thank you for coming on the podcast. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. So, of course, uh, first order of business, if you could tell the listeners a little bit about yourself, your interests, why you're interested in them and, and the work that you do, um, that'd be great. Yeah, so um, I actually have um, two kind of research agendas. I like to say, you know, one pays the bills and whether one is uh, just because I am absolutely fascinated by it. But the one that kind of pays the bills is the social media stuff. So I, um, I'm a, a, a social media critic and researcher. Um, I try to focus on pro-social aspects related to social media uses. Um, so I write a column for The Vindicator, a newspaper that's based in Youngstown, Ohio, and that comes out every Wednesday. Um, and I like to say they only give me 475 words because I could talk forever and write forever about this stuff. Um, and now what they do is they actually take all the stuff that I write and uh, they, they cut it down. They put the longer form online because they don't have to worry about print costs. So that's always nice. And then, uh, but the stuff that I love to, to, to um, research, and I've been researching for um, the better part of 15 years, is um, sports fanaticism or sports fandom. Um, so the books that I write or co-author or co-edit with uh, colleagues ar uh, around the, the United States um, focus uh, just on that, on, on why people are so fascinated with sports, why they devote so much time, so much energy, um, so much income, <laughs> in many cases, to their love of, of sports. Um, and then uh, in about a few weeks, actually, I take a sabbatical for one year where I'm doing nothing but um, uh, touring the, the nation, interviewing um, sports fandoms, sports fanatics, as well as um, experts in the field uh, of psychology and sociology and communication and people who uh, devote a lot of time to um, understanding what sports fans do and how they tick. Um, and my emphasis, uh, for the most part, is going to be on how we raise kids to be responsible sports fans. Um, now, you probably thought that I was going to say responsible adults. Um, and to some extent, that is true, because I think there's a lot of life lessons that we can learn uh, about becoming a responsible human being through sports. Uh, and so one of, the, one of my stops that I'm going to make along the way, very early on, is um, at the Fred Rogers Center at St. Vincent College in Latrobe, Pennsylvania, uh, to talk with uh, um, uh, experts, uh, child media experts, about uh, how kids consume sports media. And so I, it's going to be a really exciting adventure. I'm, I'm excited about it, and uh, we'll see where it goes. Awesome. Uh, so for context, uh, you are a huge Pittsburgh sports fan. Oh, yeah. Right? Oh, huge, yeah. In fact, if you're and looking around my office right now, um, it's, it's funny when people come in and they look around and they see all of my, my stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a big time uh, for Pittsburgh as the oh, Penguins yeah. are in the Stanley Cup, just as it is very exciting for uh, Cleveland fans with the Cavaliers in the NBA Finals. 
But it seems to be these two teams are heading in two different directions and each have very unique fan yeah. cultures. Pittsburgh with this rich history of winning and Cleveland with this long suffering until last year. Uh, could you talk a little bit about how these two communities, while very similar, have completely different uh, environments when it comes to sports? Yeah, well, I mean, completely different, but in, in, in many ways, uh, very much the same. I mean, they're both very, uh, when, when you look at the region, they're, they're both very blue-collar, Rust Belt, um, kind of rising from the ashes areas where um, there was a rich history of sports in the 60s and 70s, especially surrounding football. Uh, with the Cleveland Browns and the Pittsburgh Steelers, I mean, that was a rivalry to be watched. Um, and that has since kind of dwindled. Uh, it really died off when Modell moved the Cleveland Browns to Baltimore and that, you know, they had since become the Baltimore Ravens. But uh, but but in, in many ways, they're mirror cities. Um, and, and they're both kind of experiencing you know, a lot of rebirth. Um, you know, in particular, when you look at Pittsburgh, they're they're seeing rebirth in terms of um, healthcare and technology, uh, and, and and it's really amazing um, to watch that happen, um, especially with the with the downturn in the steel industry. But yes, when you look at the success of sports teams, I remember being a kid growing up in the '70s in Pittsburgh, and there was no escaping it. I mean, you had to be a Pirates fan, you had to be a Steelers fan because. Uh, you know, you, there was so much success surrounding those teams. There, it, it was it, we became quite spoiled, and, and, and in some ways, we became kind of like uh, the New Englanders of today. Um, I, I, I made this mistake once. I was interviewed by a guy for CNET.com, who's a, a sports writer and a, a political writer, Terry Collins, and uh, I, I made the mistake of, uh, and you know, journalists, and they'll they'll pick up on any little thing that you say, and. I made one kind of passing comment at the end of that about how I thought that New England fans were spoiled. And, of course, he wrote that in his column, and I got skewered over that. But, but in many ways, that's, that's how Pittsburgh fans were in the, in the 70s. And, um, but then the 80s came along, and it kind of died off, and uh, we had some moderate success in the 90s. Um, and, 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 but, you know, the weird part about it, and on, a, on a personal note, was that as a kid, um, I I I was I'm so I'm a tall guy. I'm in in um, and Jordan and Jacob know this. I'm I'm six foot eight. You know I'm a, I'm a big guy and I, and I, uh, I I was this now eighty pounds ago. Um, I was a basketball player. Of course, I put on all this weight, and now people think that I'm a football player. Uh, but yeah, but but uh, but but I I loved basketball. But we didn't have a basketball team. In, in Pittsburgh, nothing that you know, th nothing to write home about anyway. I mean, and certainly in the '70s, that that wasn't in, um, something that that fans clamored for in in, in Pittsburgh. So, but I really liked basketball, so you know, I, I kind of latched onto Larry Bird, and Magic Johnson. I kind of wanted to emulate them and be like them, but but I still wanted a team to cheer for. So uh, my mom said, "Well, you know." we don't have a, a, a professional basketball team in Pittsburgh, so why don't you just find the closest one and cheer for them? So I looked at a map, and lo and behold, there's Cleveland. And I thought, well, that's my team. That's that's the team I'm going to cheer for. And uh, I, I didn't know that I was setting myself up for so much year, so many years of pain and misery um, and, and, you know, watching um, Michael Jordan dash my hopes at a, at a chance of a, of a championship. But um, But the weird part is... When you tell somebody from Pittsburgh that you're a Cleveland Cavaliers fan, they, they almost kind of groan a little bit. And when you tell other Cavs fans, fellow Cavs fans, that you're a Pittsburgh fan for everything else, they, they just don't understand it. And the best, the best story about this I can tell you is when I was in uh, Cleveland, at a, uh, it was game four, this was two years ago, so this was uh, the first run at the Warriors. Um, I was game four of the Eastern Conference Finals versus Atlanta, and uh, I was there with my nephew. He's also a Pittsburgh kid and, you know, big big Pittsburgh fan, but also a Cavs fan. And uh, we're sitting there, and um, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but what do you know what they want you to do uh, when the other team's bringing the ball up the court? They, they, they want you to boo, right? They want you to say boo or, you know, like scream or whatever, make noise, right? 
So, so how how did they get you? How, how did they get you to do that? Do you know how they get you to do that? Uh, yeah, oh, they yeah, show they a show, Steelers logo. Oh, yeah. it is or on, Ben Roethlisberger. Yes, yeah. <laughs> it is unbelievable, right? So, I, so Jordan and I are sitting there. Uh, Jordan, Jordan is my my nephew, and and uh, we're sitting there, and he says, uh, "What? Wait a minute! What are what's going on here? Like, how? What? Are, we can't boo! What is this crap? Right?" Um, and so the guy, this guy, this huge Cleveland fan is sitting right next to us and he is just laughing. He goes, Oh, you can do it today. Come on, let it go. And I'm like, so I had all this cognitive dissonance, right? Um, <laughs> but, but that really kind of tells you a little bit about, you know, the difference of, you know, being a, a, a Cavs fan and trying to be a Pittsburgh sports fan at the same time. It's really difficult. So for, for further context for everyone listening, um, we're all to some degree, uh, maybe not from Youngstown, but situated in Youngstown. So Jordan and I both went to Youngstown State. Dr. Earnhardt teaches at Youngstown State. And Youngstown is a small city nestled right in the middle of the corridor between yeah. Pittsburgh and Cleveland. So you get some nice intermingling between Pittsburgh fans and Cleveland fans. Oh, yeah. Uh, which which leads to a lot of tension it, <laughs> in, in, in situations where, you know, there's actual competition. Uh, Cleveland had, the Browns had one... <laughs> winning record from what i remember was that 07 2007 was that? i think I that think. was it and i remember on campus uh people were actually proud to wear browns jersey so you would see a lot of them that year and uh, i remember people were like would kind of run their mouths as you were walking past people especially uh if those teams were playing that week it was an interesting week but that was only a, a flash in the pan because the the browns are terrible <laughs> well here's what's strange about sports fandom is you said that people would run their mouths as they're walking you know to and from class and in my yeah, head I'm thinking, playing oh yeah well in my head i'm thinking <laughs> uh you know i miss that that'd be nice that'd be fun yeah. and then i'm like well wait, wait that's kind of insane well, well why do you think that well you know and, and, and so 1996 here's a here's a, a kind of interesting side note to that because uh, um i i experienced a lot of pain when um the cleveland browns moved to baltimore and and i'll tell you if, if you know it's interesting to see kind of the moves that are going on now with the Raiders moving to Vegas. Um, for those of you, your, or for those of your listeners who don't know this, you know, there, the you have um, the San Diego Chargers are leaving; they're moving uh, to Los Angeles. The the Oakland Raiders are moving their team um, uh, to, to Las Vegas, and you know, and for those fan bases, that's that's a huge hit, right? And and it reminds me so much of, but not to the same level of what happened to the Cleveland Browns in, in 1995 and 1996 when Art Modell moved them to Baltimore. I remember, so being a Steelers fan, you know, I, I, we kind of looked at this like they were they were destroying, Art Modell was destroying our rivalry. I mean, we, we put a lot of um, effort, a lot of energy into that rivalry as sports fans. And the fact that, that, that he was basically taking that rivalry away from us was almost like he was taking a, a part of the Steelers away from us too. So so we actually stood side by side, arm in arm, with Browns fans. I mean, if you want to see these, it's, it's, it's really a weird sight to kind of see these two, these two groups of fans um, kind of like protesting together to stop this move because in so many ways it was a, a crushing blow to our identity as sports fans. Um, now, I say that because you know this. This actually, uh, there was a protest that happened um, in in uh, in one of the squares in Pittsburgh, and Cleveland Browns fans and Steelers fans joined on the same day that there was a game going on at what was then Three River Stadium, and um, I remember it so well because it was it was televised on the evening news, but there was no mention of it at any time on the NFL broadcast. In fact, um, you know they they made a per they made it a point not to even talk about it. And I think at some point I don't know who the commissioner was back then, but you know they said don't don't even mention this on your broadcast because we don't want to talk about it. Um, now, so that happened very unsuccessful protest, but still you know they they did get, they did get a team back. But a few weeks after that happened, um, the Steelers were were making a march through the playoffs uh, that year and. Um, uh, and I was always wearing, you know, head to toe black and gold. I mean, I, I wore it everywhere. I was uh, fresh out of college. I was, you know, trying to make uh, a move in the media, uh, get a job. And 
but uh, I was a huge fan of Howard Stern back then. I uh, bought all of his books, and uh, there was a, a Howard Stern book signing in Cleveland uh, a couple of weeks after that that protest. So I, you know, I I donned my Steelers gear. I thought I'm I'm safe in Cleveland now because we're all friends. <laughs> And I go to this book signing, and there's this huge line, this sea of orange wrapped around this building, right? Now, so you would think that the Browns are leaving. It's done. It's a done deal. Why would anybody wear orange, right? Well, all of those fans still had this huge devotion to the Cleveland Browns. In fact, whenever uh, the NFL you know, agreed to actually listen to the fans and the city, um, the, the NFL said, okay, you get to keep the name, the Browns. We're going we're gonna to give you another team. You get to keep the name. You get to keep the colors. You get to keep the records, all of those things. Art Modell was not allowed to take them with him. But I thought to myself, well, we're all brothers now. We're all brothers and sisters. So I can, I can wear my black and gold, and I can enter the sea of orange without fear. Well, as I'm wake, making my way to the back of the line to get my book signed, um, I start hearing all this, Steelers suck. Oh, we hate the Steelers. Oh, you guys are terrible. You know, and after a while, I'm hearing this, like, walking back this line, and I, I don't know what came over me, but I said something along the lines of, well, at least we still have a team. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, my God. I, oh, no. Ne- That's low. Needless to say, <laughs> needless to say, I did not get my book signed. Um, I left because I was just getting pummeled with ice balls. So it, was, it snowed. <laughs> And the snow was kind of like that tight packing snow. You know, you know, all the Northeasterners know what that is, right? And I just got pummeled. And I, I actually had bruises the next day from all the snowballs that hit me. So that, so the, the kumbaya moment was over. <laughs> and here I am as a Cleveland fan asking myself why you didn't deserve that. Oh, every, <laughs> I deserved every piece of it, yep. Well, it should be noted, uh, Rooney – the owner of the Steelers was the only one to vote against yeah. the uh, the move as well, too. Oh, that's, so that's, it went all the way to the top. Yeah, I'll tell you what, man. There, there, is, there are a few owners in the NFL that fans revere uh, more than Rooney and the Rooney family. I mean, I just, you know, I, I actually I just got chills when you mentioned his name because – that's the kind of devotion that 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 fans have to a team with an owner like that. I mean, um, there there's the Rooney Rule, the Rooney Rule, which uh, you mm-hmm. know still goes down to this day as probably one of the most influential rules uh, in 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 the NFL. And that is that you know whenever you're um, interviewing um, for a head coaching position, you have to interview at least one minority candidate, right? So what happened to us? We interviewed using the Rooney Rule, and what we got, Mike Tomlin. Um, I mean that that's just he's the epitome of what an NFL what a professional sports team owner should be. Oh yeah, and they have a fantastic coach in Tomlin too. Oh, he's amazing. Yeah, I mean, you know, he's um he's a players coach. You know, so there are a lot of players that see him. Um he he cheers, he comes out onto the field and actually like, you know, high fives his players. Um and that's the, that's the kind of coach that not only the the the, the um, the players can get behind, but the fans get behind. Fans see that, and that riles them up too. So in Youngstown, in the midst of the Pens and the the Cup Finals and the Cavs and the NBA Finals, uh, obviously, you know, sometimes there's pandemonium. Yeah. Uh, and almost on any given night, if you go out to any bar or restaurant, you know, it's packed with either black and gold or, or wine and gold. Um, yeah. So – Observing that, I mean, whether from a sociological standpoint or a psychological standpoint, can you take some time to describe the nature of fandom or what your work has sort of taught you or or revealed to you about it? Yeah. So we know that fans are motivated by a variety of things. Um, And in in fact, what one of the things that my research looked at is um, what are what is that motive typology and what are the things that drive people to. Uh, want to cheer on certain teams, um, certain times of the year, certain sports. Um, and we find that um, there, re- there really are a- a- about four or five basic overriding motives um, that, um, that, mer- that emerge. And, and the biggest one is that geographical identity so or, or a regional identity. So, for example, um, if you live in a certain region and that region has a successful sports franchise, and it doesn't necessarily have to be professional. Sometimes it's college. 
Um, for example, if you look uh, in our state, in Ohio, um, there's a big region around the middle of the state in Columbus that has a huge Ohio State uh, University fan base for football and, and for basketball, for that matter. Um, and so, but because uh, they don't, well, I mean, they have a couple professional sports franchises um, for Major League Soccer and uh, and hockey. Uh, but beyond that, they're, they're, that, that love really is kind of centered in that region for Ohio State. In much the same way, we, have, we see the same thing happen in places like um, Philadelphia and Pittsburgh and, 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 and Cincinnati and Cleveland um, that kind of center around that region. So if you're from that region, you, you tend to cheer on that, that – um, or if you were born in that region or raised in that region, you tend to cheer on those teams. <clears throat> and, I, and that's important because if you see – um, people who have been relocated, um, people who have been displaced because of economic reasons or work reasons or family reasons, um, they, they tend to take a piece of that region with them, right? So they were forced to leave because they had a love, uh, or they were forced to leave because of work or whatever, but they wanted to take a piece of that region with them. And so what they did was they took the sports team with them, right? Um, and so we saw we see these huge fan bases for the Cleveland Browns. Whether they're successful or not really doesn't matter for the Cleveland Browns, by the way. I mean, the, the people what people are doing, the reason why they still cheer for that team is they're cheering for the region, um, and in some cases more so than they're cheering for the team. And so they, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see huge fan bases for these teams, Um in, in other parts of the country, in other parts of the world. Uh, the Browns backers, for example, um, Jeff Tyus and I have looked at this. Uh, Dr. Jeff Tyus, also at Youngstown State, uh, also does some work in, um, in sports fandom, uh, ha- have found that the Browns backers are actually one of the largest uh, fan bases in the world. And all you have to do is look at um, where their different chapters are and, and why they cheer the way they do. Uh, and, and you can find it. It's all based in their displacement from that region. Um, and so <clears throat> where we see a big part of this happen is in the downturn of the steel industry, for example. So when the steel industry collapsed in the 80s, uh, people had to move. People had to find work other places. And uh, when they did... They moved, in some cases, moved their whole families, but they but they wanted to take a piece of that region, and then so they took their sports teams with them, especially in the case of Pittsburgh, where they were successful sports teams. Now, that's one motive. There are several more. One is another one is family. Um, we we cheer on certain teams because mom and dad do, because our our uncle did, um, and you know, as a kid growing up. Um, you, you want to emulate that person. You want to um, you want to be like your favorite uncle or your favorite aunt or your grandpa or somebody who's always talking about sports. And so because of that, you kind of fall in love with that team. Um, <clears throat> you know, a good example of that was uh, there's, a, there's a student who was here who told me the story once about, um, you know, his, 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 he was raised in uh, Newcastle and his mother remarried. And he really latched on to uh, his his stepfather, and he wanted to be a lot like his stepfather. He wanted to impress his stepfather. Well, for for all intents and purposes, this kid should have been a Pittsburgh Steelers fan. Um, but because he was trying to impress his stepfather, his stepfather was a Browns fan. And so he became a Browns fan because he wanted to be like his stepdad. He wanted to kind of latch on to him. And that and so there's there's a there's a, an overriding motivation for why somebody became a certain fan. Um, lots of other reasons why. One is um, the social aspect. We just like to be around people. Uh, we watch because other people are watching. I mean, that the Super Bowl is, is the epitome of that. I mean, we, you have people who are clearly not sports fans any other time of the year, especially not football fans, but then that one time of the year, Lady Gaga's playing in the Super Bowl, and so we're going to watch, right? Um and, 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 and pretend like we know who Tom Brady is and all that other stuff. Uh, and, and, and then uh, people watch because they just, uh, they're, they're attracted to the sport. Uh, they're attracted to the athletes. The athletes themselves sometimes uh, are beautiful and sexy and interesting, and so we're attracted to them. Or we're attracted to the aesthetics of the sport, which is also beauty. 
Uh, we're, we're attracted to how people play, why they play, um, the, the, these beautiful plays that are made. I mean, hell, ESPN devotes the last, you know, sometimes minute or two to the top 10 plays of the day on every sports center. Um, and because we love to see beautiful things happen at play. Um, and, you know, sometimes we watch sports because we like to learn about sports. We wanna, we wanna, we're motivated by um, the stats. Um, there, there are stats-driven fans who are just so um, consumed with, with um, the, the runs batted in and, and all of the other minor stats that kind of um, make sports interesting for them. Um, so, again, those are just a few of the reasons why we watch. But um, for many people, it's complicated in that there are – um, several motives for why they watch, uh, but there are many more beyond that. One of the the biggest one you mentioned was regional identity, and this seems to intersect with a few other behavioral traits that uh, of, in your work I had read and I remember you talking about, um, namely uh, Berging, and I think this in my opinion, or and maybe I'm completely wrong, but this really feeds into that. That regional identity totally feeds into that because people see their team as successful or winning, um, and then they kind of take on that uh, that success. I, for a really great example that I remember was Kelly Pavlik winning the, uh, I think it was a middleweight uh, world belt. Oh, yeah, belt. yeah. <laughs> and I, everyone in Youngstown was so pumped. Like, he's here. And, <laughs> but then with that came this, like, ridiculous sense of like aggression and toughness yeah. and everyone just assumed that because he was uh, it was a very like hyper masculine time in Youngstown Every, when he was champion everybody was wearing those affliction t-shirts <laughs> yes, yes. yes oh I remember oh those. it was awful yeah um, remember affliction yeah you know and, and here's here's the bad part to that um is that yes I mean everybody so so for the for your listeners who don't know you know Kelly Pavlik was this um was this rising star in, in uh, professional boxing and um, really making a name for himself. And, in fact, if you would watch any of his bouts on HBO or Showtime um, or pay-per-view, um, you know, George Foreman even it's, at one point said, this is our hope for boxing, right? And, I mean, imagine that. So you're Kelly Pavlik. You've got a drinking problem, which was well-documented. Um and, and, and now he's had many run-ins with, with the law and everything else. He's got kind of like this, this major downfall. Um, but you had George Foreman, of all people, basically on there saying, this is our hope, right? So you're putting all this pressure on this kid who already has serious demons, serious issues already. And, and then on top of all that, you've got this region kind of circling behind him, um, you know, che- cheering him on, cheering him on. And man, as soon as he fell from grace, the whole place turned against him. Um, and I've, I've, ne- I've never really seen anything like that happen in, in a region this size. I mean, we see, clearly we see it in, 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 on bigger uh, platforms, like with, with Kobe Bryant and, and, uh, and around Los Angeles, whenever the whole rape thing happened, the rape allegations happened. And, and certainly with Ben Roethlisberger, outside of Pittsburgh because in Pittsburgh he could do no wrong but outside of Pittsburgh I mean he it was he was uh, damaged goods um, it's it's really interesting to kind of see that happen in a region but with Pavlik it was really distressing because um, there was so much pressure put on him that I think it was just kind of unbearable so I think that there actually is an intersection here where we can segue this conversation into elements of prior conversations that we've had on the podcast so which by the way i've listened to do you, do you, you like it? oh you i like i it? love it yeah you guys are doing a great job great. we've Thank got you. some really cool it. guests coming up uh i think you'll be excited yeah, i'm looking forward to some, it. some pretty big ones um so you said in pittsburgh ben roethlisberger could do no wrong um, and i think this is an illustration of a question i wanted to ask you so academics like noam chomsky have said and i think he said this off the cuff, I don't think he, you know, has done any work on sports fandom, but he made the comment that in the same way that you can be kind of jingoistic about amping up, say, uh, nationalism when your country is getting ready to go to war and that that can lead to irrational behavior or um, irrational acquiescence, like that, that these sort of thoughts that run through our head, we, we sort of, you know, plan our flag and we identify as a certain thing. And then we don't really question the motives of the actors that we're supporting. 
he made the comment once that that sports fandom is a microcosm of that same sort of thing. So of course the stakes are lower if we're talking about who's winning a football game or you know how we're interacting with other fans. And so for instance, you got pelted with snowballs and it certainly can be worse, but then we take it a step further and we say, okay, so Ben Roethlisberger, who, who was never convicted of anything, but there are these serious allegations against him and, um, and you say in Pittsburgh, Ben Roethlisberger can do no wrong. And I have huge doubts that that is unique to Pittsburgh fans. I mean, I'm sure there's always this sort of oh, sure. relativism that applies to any fan base's players. If something happens, you know, they're going to, without any evidence one way or the other, begin immediately justifying in their head why it can't be the case that one of their heroes did something wrong to avoid that cognitive dissonance of cheering for someone who might also not be a good person. Yeah. So. Do you? I mean, do you see a tie in there? Do you think Chomsky is pushing it, or or do you think that the underlying psychological factors that drive sports fandom are similar to the same psychological factors that can drive, say, nationalism that leads to dangerous consequences in international relations, for example? No, I I, I think you're right. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of parallels there with what Chomsky said. Um, <laughs> I'm laughing because. I'm, I'm thinking to myself, huh, of all this interviews I've done over the years, sports-related, <laughs> this is the first time Chomsky's ever come up. Um, <laughs> welcome, welcome to Think nah, I love it. I love it. No, that's, A that's, smart podcast. I, it's beautiful. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, and actually, it, okay, so it reminds me of an, uh, a, a, a response piece that I did for Playboy. Um, and it was it was it, it re- related to uh, an article that uh, was written. It was called Just Win, Baby. And um, it was funny because at the time uh, when the article was written, it was right around the time that um, LeBron James, Cleveland Cavaliers, uh, you know, the, the, the basketball superstar, was making his move from uh, Cleveland to Miami. And, um, and it was interesting because they were trying to draw these parallels between what he was doing and how it affected the fan base and what um, – uh, Roethlisberger uh, was accused of doing, and, and and Kobe Bryant, and and some other players. I mean, some of the negative things that were happening, that were um, very violent acts, very violent things. Um, and they were trying to draw this parallel between what what LeBron James was doing and how it was affecting the fan base, and and what um, what these other players uh, were doing or accused of doing. And so my, my very – actually, this goes back to my dissertation at, at Kent State University. I, I uh, studied what fan reactions were to um, their favorite athlete who had um, committed crimes, all right, or um, uh, committed like, – or, or just performed these antisocial behaviors, right? And what was interesting was is that um, – and I'm not sure how much of this is actually true – um, and, and so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, kind of like, 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 uh, devalidate my, my thesis a little bit by saying that I've seen fans who will basically turn on a dime whenever their, um, uh, favorite athlete is accused of doing something. So for example, the whole Aaron Hernandez thing, when that went down in new England, um, fans outside of new England were like, yeah, this guy is a horrible human being. Um, you know, this the, if, if he should go to jail. He should rot in jail. All this other thing. Fans in New England, of course, were saying, "Well, no. I mean, this you know, innocent until proven guilty, right?" Well, I asked the same fans, uh, some similar fans in New England, if they felt that way about Ben Roethlisberger, and uh, you know, in, innocent until proven guilty. He goes, "Oh no, he's guilty as hell. I mean, he's guilty of sin," and. And you know, it's so when you're trying to like look at it that way, it's almost like, and it kind of goes back to the premise of the article that was in, in Playboy was this idea that it's just win, baby. I mean, if you're if you're just if you just win, that's all that matters. But man, if you're on it, if you do something horrible and you're on a team that's losing, you are gone, and 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 the fans will turn on you, and um and 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 that's it. And so we saw that happen to Kelly Pavlik in Youngstown. We see that happen to players for the Cleveland Browns, where you know if you're not if you're not winning and you do something horrible, that's just even more of a reason why we need to to, to get rid of you. Um, so there's a lot of that that happens, and yeah, I do see some parallels with what what Chomsky's saying. <clears throat> of course, most sports fans would never 
understand that, but 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 it's it's okay. But but uh, but but it, it but it's true. Um, and I also kind of want to go back to the point too of uh, what 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 Jake, uh, I'm sorry, Jordan was uh, making about burging. By the way, burging um, for for your listeners who, who don't know this, um, burging stands for uh, basking in the reflective glow. So after a team wins, if you're burging, you demonstrate that by you know the next day you'll you'll wear the team's jersey or you'll say things like you know our team won, we did it, we're we're champions. Versus something like corfing. Corfing is cutting off reflective failure, uh, where you'll basically you won't wear the team's jersey the next day, or you'll refer to the the team in in third person, or you'll say they did this or they did that. You know those bums, those kind of that kind of thing. Um, I I think we still see a lot of that, but uh, you know we're starting to see things that are a little strange now too with with teams who are or, or fans bases who are saying things like um, they're they're cutting off future failure, so it's c- yeah. coughing, right? And I think so. I think one of you guys, we were, we were. Uh, so I'm, I'm doing that now. With that was yours. Yeah. I still don't yeah. know. Well, I still don't know what that means. So I I'm do not me. have hopes. High so if you guys don't, I'm, I'm totally coughing. If you don't mind me mentioning this, I mean, we were, we were. Uh, so for your listeners, we we were actually uh, uh, Jacob and Jordan and I were were tweeting back and forth at each other yesterday, and I, I just I really appreciated that somebody mentioned coughing and in one of those, those messages. But, but yeah, I, I think we see a lot of that and, and it's all psychological. I mean, we do it because, um, our, we, we just want to make sure that we're setting ourselves up for success, for, for future success, for future failure. But I think in the cases of particularly, since we're talking about the Pittsburgh Penguins and, and the Cleveland Cavaliers, since they're on a championship runs, I think what we're starting to see is this, um, Basking in spite of failure, and what I mean by that is, uh, and, and, and you know this, you've seen this happen in the past, especially with with uh, fans of very successful teams, where they'll do things like, "Oh yeah, but I mean we've got this great," f-. and 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 Jacob and uh, was talking about this before we went on, where, um, well yeah, we've got this great nucleus of this team, so clearly we're going to be back next year. We're going to be awesome. We had this great season, and so in a sense. If the Cavs don't do well, and I like to say that that's still a big if. I mean, we're only you know, we're two games down. Um, you know, then I think you're still still, still going to see a lot of fans, a lot of the Cleveland fan base who are going to say, "We're coming back next year. We still have LeBron James. We've got all. We've got the nucleus. We've got this team. We're going to be awesome." And I and I think you'll see Pittsburgh Penguins fans do the same thing. I I'm not very optimistic <laughs> about this series, but I I'm I'm not as stressed out or upset. I, I'm almost indifferent because Cleveland won last year, and this is totally different than how I felt last year. I was a nervous wreck in the finals last year because at that point, it, we were just so close. We were so close to winning, and I'm saying we as if I'm part of the team. <laughs> they were so close. They, yeah. they. But when they exactly, lose, exactly. it's they. Yeah, uh, yeah I, last year I was a nervous wreck, biting my nails. I was on the edge of my seat the entire time, and now this season they've – kind of got thumped the first two games oh, yeah. and I'm just like well we won last year yeah I mean it's just it's a natural reaction right I mean psychologically that's what you have to do your, your brain just goes that way because you feel like I've got to I have to set myself up for this I've got to sit I, I've got to process this so that I'm not completely let down if the, if if this really goes south I wonder if that intersects with the geographical relationship you had mentioned because teams like the Yankees and certainly in Pittsburgh, and as we were talking about with college teams, how they demand excellence, but then you have a team and a fan base like Cleveland who isn't as accustomed to winning. I wonder if that, if those two ideas intersect and how their behaviors might change when, say, Alabama might not win a national championship and that's considered a failure, or LSU might not beat Alabama and their coach gets fired. Unbelievable. But otherwise, they're like they're great teams. And I just want in Cleveland, you get three years, and if you get four wins, it's you're doing all right. You're growing. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing. I, this I, and you and I were talking about this on Twitter yesterday. But college football just blows me away. I mean, I I, I still don't understand how um, we have all of this talent around the country, and we still don't have parity in college football. Um, and, and and I know why I know why it is because you know these 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 top athletes gravitate toward the best programs, um, and so that's why you see teams like Alabama and Clemson and Ohio State with with uh, you know twenty uh, 
20 athletes that go in the NFL draft every year. I mean, it's, it's, there's a reason why that happens is because they have, you know, they have positioned themselves as the best in the country. But I, I think, um, you know, I don't know. I mean, in, in terms of, um, fan bases, there's a, there's a bit of a difference between the, um, uh, professional fan base and the college fan base. And, 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 and here's what it is. We know that, um, if you think of who, who was the first team that you cheered for, think about that. The who, Indians. Okay, but the Indians. Cleveland Browns. Okay, let me let me. So so then let me rephrase this question: Who was the first non-professional team that you cheered for? Ohio State. Youngstown State, because I was a kid during the the four national championship run. See, I mean, it's almost like, and you went to, and you, and then you went to Youngstown State, and I, I even go back further than that with some some fans when I talk to them, I'm like, okay, but, but even before that, who was the first team that you cheered for? And they'll go back to their high school teams and things like that. And for, and, and by the way, for for your listeners who don't know, um, I remember Jordan when he was a sports writer for the jam bar. Weren't you, weren't you a sports writer? <laughs> yeah, right? I was the sports editor. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and I, and, uh, which by the way, I, I love the fact that you're doing politics now because there's so, so many parallels between politics and sports. Oh my God. I mean, even the analogies like using, I heard Keith Ellison on the most recent episode of D-Ray's podcast, uh, Pod Save the People, and he was using football terminology to determine uh, his role leading the DNC. He's like, well, I ran for qu- – I wanted to be quarterback, but I'll be tailback. And just like that – that's it. Like there's so many intersects between politics and sports. We uh, – one of my best uh, – one of my favorite articles, the first article I read whenever I started diving into the whole uh, sports communication literature was the horse race analogies. In, in, yeah. in politics, I mean, it's just unbelievable. But, but, but you know, um, the, so the reason why I asked that question, though, about the first teams that you cheered for is because that's, that's really like when we learn to become fans. I mean, we watch all of this happening, all of this play out in front of us. Um, and so it's almost like you're almost always devoted to that one team, the college team, uh, for and, and this is I, I, granted this isn't going to be true for um, all of your listeners, but but for most of us, I, I still go back and read scores from Clarion University where I did my bachelor's and, and, and master's degree. Uh, Clarion University, which is a small D D two school, it's a D two school in the middle of Pennsylvania. I still go back and 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 and, and read online, read their 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 scores from the weekend, um, just because I'm. That's my, you know, that's my one of my alma maters, right? I mean, I, I still think about that, and that's where I kind of like learn to become a sports fan a little bit, a little bit in high school, but but mainly in college. And so, a lot of our identities as as sports fans are kind of wrapped up in those college teams. And man, when you start talking to Alabama fans and they start throwing out that roll tide crap, and and <laughs> or 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 the uh, you know or Florida State or or Clemson. It is really remarkable to watch because they are. I mean, all you have to do is watch the Paul Feinbaum sh- show or listen to it. Those fans are unbelievable, and it is just beautiful to watch. Yeah, SEC fans are. Oh rabid. my gosh! If they, they do you ever listen to the fa- Paul Feinbaum show? I I, I, I I don't, but I know who you're talking about. I, I really about. encourage you guys if you ever and, and your listeners. Just just listen to one episode. And and so for those of you who don't know who Paul Feinbaum is, I mean, he's basically like an SEC guru. He's a football guru, but he's an SEC guru. And, and uh, he just basically takes calls. That's all he does. He takes calls for the entire show, um, interviews a few people, but the calls from these people, and they've got these beautiful southern accents, and, uh, and they just rip into fans and coaches and athletes from other teams. Um, and it's, some of it's despicable. Some of it is the lowest form of, of human behavior. Uh, but but other, others, uh, they're just priceless to listen to. And that, and that kind of gives you um, kind of a, like a, like a little um, uh, insight into what the SEC fans are really all about. Can I just say that's an overrated, top-heavy conference? Oh, yeah. Just put it on the record. <laughs> yeah, it's such garbage. Way they, overrated. Uh, Way overrated. Alabama or Auburn or whoever's at the top each year will lose to some, like, mid-conference team. And it's always – the justification is always, well, this just goes to show how deep this oh, conference please. is. please. And then someone in the Big Ten will lose to someone of a similar position in uh, – Oh, they're weak. In the Big Ten. They're yeah, weak. it's like, oh, gosh, now y'all, this conference Y'all know what's so going to happen now, right? <laughs> You know, any, anybody, anybody, any SEC fan who's going to listen to this podcast, are they oh, done? Oh, they are. They are going to blast you guys and me probably 
on on Twitter. I mean, they, they, they they're yeah. rabid. They're rabid fans. I yeah. Have you ever seen the Alabama super fan? Oh yes, the guy yes. With the, he's got like the Bear Bryant tattoo and Rammer Jammer on his forearm. Beautiful, just beautiful people. He's a perfect example of how these guys are. Like, this is their life. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I don't want to be hypocritical because the uh, the Ohio State super fans oh, are horrible. Oh yeah, yeah. That on big, the top of my list of my nut. favorite people. Yeah. I mean, okay, so you, you have yeah. to. I mean, and, and for for the for your listeners who don't understand like what what this this atmosphere is like. I mean, these people, um, uh, they they purchase Winnebago's. They they load up their Winnebago's, you know, six, seven, eight times a year, depending on how successful the team is. They, they sometimes they'll travel to the away games, but mostly they're going to the home games. Um, you know, you you, you go to um, State College, um, uh, Pennsylvania, and I mean that there are whole uh, farm fields full of Winnebagos on game day, where these people sometimes they'll they'll camp out two or three days in advance of the game just to you know just to you know, celebrate their the the Penn State Nittany Lions. It's amazing. Do you think that there are any drawbacks to fandom? So in the in the factors that you outlined, and I wrote them down as best I could, you know, geographical identity, family, social interaction, um, just attraction to aesthetics or learning. I mean, those all seem to be pretty uncontroversial sure. motivations, apart from maybe geographical identity, which goes back to like tribalism and what we talked about with Chomsky. But for the most part, you know, it seems like pretty pretty uncontroversial sure. motives driving the behavior. Um, do you think that there are any, any drawbacks to fandom? Oh, um, sure. I mean, whether... there are, so I mean, yeah, obviously with, um, you know, um, substance abuse and things like that. I mean, there, there are cases where, uh, all you have to do is, is, um, uh, look at, uh, look at European soccer or, or, um, in, in, in our case, football in, in many cases where you've got, uh, drunk fans, people who are just belligerent that uh, you know shouldn't be drinking alcohol on a good day, let alone at a at a park at a you know um, that that we've had to set up family sections at these stadiums um, is a testament to that. You know, you've got sections where um, families feel safe. <laughs> I, it's just remarkable where they have to be away from these belligerent drunk fans. But yeah, I mean. Um, there are there are sports that kind of attract that type of fan. I want to be careful about how I say this, um, because there are like if, if soccer is a, is a is a good example where it's we see a different kind of fan. Um, I uh, I heard Colin Coward once uh, who's um, uh, um, has a has a sports talk show for I think it's for Fox now, um, where he talks about the wine and cheese fan. And we we see a lot of that happen in, in with with uh, Major League Soccer, but it's weird because it's com- it's a complete opposite to the kind of fan that uh, attends European soccer games. So the European soccer fans are, uh, and I'm not talking about the hooligans because I mean obviously they're they're a completely different level of um, of uh, fanatic, but but uh, and, and and sometimes their their level of interest in sports isn't always. Um, it's not related to sports. It's just related to being, um, a th- you know, and a gang or a thug or something like that. Sure, uh, but but um, so I I think you know that's the kind of of behavior that is is uh, that it's negative. And then you get uh, and then from there you can go a little bit deeper, but it's not as frequent where um, some fans become very violent. Um, now some of that. Aggression, some of that violence is fueled by alcohol, but not always. Um, some of that, some of that violence is just, um, you know, kind of like a deep-seated hatred for somebody just because they're wearing a different color or they're where they're so they're celebrating a different uh, different team, and that person sees it as an attack on that person's identity um, or or region or whatever, and so that then they 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 become violent and they they hit or in some cases, seriously maim and, and kill other fans, which we've, we've seen in some cases. But th- these are very rare cases, but it happens. Mm-hmm. And that's that's a that's a theme of a lot of these conversations, it, whether it's sports oh or politics. God. We talk about polarization. We talk about echo chambers. We talked about the outrage machine. And if, you know, 
you view these differences as so fundamental that they are distinctions not just between what football team you root for but distinctions between the very personhood um, of two individuals that that we're talking about you know viewing someone as an other because they root for a different team um, or the same applies to politics and then we i don't think we get any any positive results from that sort of otherization that happens and and i chomsky's thesis was that sports fandom is sort of a, a prep course for you know, bigger, similar things. Yeah. I don't know if I agree with that. I certainly haven't. I'm certainly not the, the academic that Chomsky is, but I mean, I just think people can be tribal and whether we devote those sort of energies to sports fandom or to nationalism at, at bottom, we have these tendencies and then it just becomes a matter of checking them and suppressing them when we need to. And just being mindful that, you know, above all else, we have to find commonalities to the exclusion of focusing on the differences, especially if that focus can fuel the sort of actions that you talk. Well, we about. do it every four years. I mean, we, we sell, here's the thing. Like I, every, I, I, I love the Olympics because, um, uh, not, not because the, the United States dominates in the summer Olympics in particular. I mean, I, obviously I love that because that's a, a national pride thing. And I, I get wrapped up in that every four years. Winter Olympics, not so much. Cause we're, you know, we're not, the best at, at, at everything, but, um, but, but certainly there's, we see that celebration happen and play out in the Olympics. And I just don't understand why that can't happen in, in every sport. Now it doesn't, in some cases it does. In some cases we, we celebrate other teams and, um, we, we, we you know, we, we pat each other on the back and certainly we're, we're taught to do that as, uh, in little league, you know, when we high five the other team and shake their hands and all that kind of stuff, and but but as fans um, of professional teams, for some reason that there's it's almost like us. It's it's yes, I mean I understand the importance of us versus them. We want to win. We want to be the champions. But it's supposed to be fun, and I think that there's there's a few fans that drag that down. I mean I think there are a few fans that kind of. Um, and they go, they go on to Twitter, they go on to social media, and they make these statements, and, and they they um, are very disparaging to other teams, other athletes, other fans. And that brings it down. When in reality, what it's supposed to be is this fun way for us to connect, a fun way for us to share uh, and, and to kind of learn more about our regions, our identities. I and mean, that, that's the reason why the Roman Colosseum was built. That's the reason why uh, the Romans had these big – and, and I, I, okay, understandably, they were very gruesome back then, but but they they had these competitions because they were trying to celebrate the different regions of Rome, um, and 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 that's in some ways the reasons why we have sports now is because we're trying to celebrate our our different regions. If if you remember, I think it was the Women's World Cup in 2015, the United States and Japan were facing off against each other. And all of these people were making Pearl Harbor jokes oh or like Hiroshima jokes. And it was just like, I, I, I just. So uncomfortable. And this relates to, yeah, and it relates to war in a very similar way because you look at your mm-hmm. opponent, whether on a battlefield or a playing field, and because you want to win and you want your team to do well and you identify with them, you're willing to dehumanize your opponent. And I mean, invoking mass slaughter of innocent civilians was yeah. like the go-to joke that day it, w- it was horrible yeah I, I remember um and i don't remember if it was the browns or the Bengals, but i remember uh the, the, the steelers fans uh hanging a quarterback in effigy you know and it 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 just was it, for me as a kid seeing that i think i was probably 14 15 years old but it was still disturbing like i i didn't understand why we sunk to that level and, uh, and, and maybe that's why I'm studying it now to understand the depravity of the sports fan. <laughs> but, but, you know, look, 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 I mean, it, it, I, and I, I, you know, I, we could take it in a negative term, but I will, I will say this. There are a lot of positive sports fans out there. There are a lot of people who are very responsible. Um, I, I still remember I was at, um, Mary Beth, my wife, um, we try to go to at least three or four, three or four Steelers games a year. And, and I and I still remember being at this Ravens Steelers game, and and it was a close game throughout, and and you know we we ended up 
uh, Steelers ended up winning, and this was at Heinz Field. And there, there were this group of Ravens fans sitting right in front of us, and we were just jawing back and forth. And we, but it was so fun, and they were having fun, and they were laughing, and we were high fiving each other. And here's the best part, right? Like I was high fiving them when their team did something good, and they were high fiving me when we scored. You know, and it was weird. Like we were actually like celebrating this rivalry in in a very positive way. And I and I think there's actually a lot more of that that goes on. Unfortunately, you don't hear about that. You hear about all the bad yeah. stuff that happens. But yeah, yeah and that's when sports is at its best. Yeah, though, when yeah, there's a lot of power in that moment because it's it, it's a turning point. You can choose to. It's very easy in that moment to not do that to actually go in the opposite direction and partake in that sort of dehumanization or otherization. So when, as a individual, you make that choice not to yeah. do that, but to acknowledge the humanity of someone who's a different, you know, who's a fan of a different team than, than the team that you're rooting for. I, mean, I just think there's a lot of power in that decision. I wonder if that starts young, because I, oh, yeah. I'm trying to think, when you were saying that, I was trying to think of that happening at, at like a kid's baseball game or a kid's soccer game, and I just can't envision parents actively cheering for the other kids. Yeah. So I'm wondering if that's something that's ingrained Ooh. in us at a very young age that your opponents, you just do not root for, you do not celebrate the success of your opponent. You know what, though? I mean, you might be onto something there because you know, this is an issue that, that um, Dan, Dan Juan um, is probably the leading psychologist right now uh, on, on, on this uh, in sports psychology. Um, and he's actually getting ready to go on sabbatical too. I was just talking to him the other day. Uh, he he's at Murray State University, um, prolific scholar, um, and and you know he's studying, um, sp- uh, but children in sports, and he's on the like the little league, uh, whatever this is, like the um, I'm I'm not doing this justice, but it's like like some kind of council or whatever that he's on, and. Um, they're looking at ways to get parents to be more responsible at these um, at their kids' sporting events, right? And Jordan, you actually might be onto something there because imagine this: imagine that you tell parents when they come in that yeah, they can cheer on their kid, but they have to cheer on the other team too. And now, obviously, we would do that anyway. You want to celebrate the other? You know, these are kids, right? But I but yeah. I still go to my kids' softball games and basketball games, and I'm amazed at how asinine some of these parents act. Like, I'm, yeah. I'm sitting there watching. How how could you, like, scream and yell at this official, at this referee, who's getting paid nothing to be there to, to officiate your kid's, your seven-year-old softball game? I mean, it's just remarkable. <laughs> I just I just don't understand it. But, but yeah, actually, you, yeah, you, you actually may be onto something. I, I think, um, you know, uh, our kids learn from watching their parents, right? I mean, I, I, I learned from watching mine. Um, my mom used to, and, and here's the funny thing. So I played college basketball for a while and, and my mom, uh, we, we, I went to a very small private school and we didn't have, um, a, a, somebody who videotaped the games. You know, there, there's always somebody who videotapes the games so you can play them back and watch them and see where you screwed up and make mistakes and, and correct those mistakes. And, um, and so my mom was that person. My mom had a video camera, so she recorded all these games, but, but she was recording them um, because she wanted to make my highlight reel. She said, "Right, so these, so she <laughs> sent out this highlight reel um, to all of these colleges. Probably sent it out to like thirty different colleges, right? And uh, and I ended up getting a scholarship to this school up in Rochester, New York, and I uh, went there for a couple years. But the funniest thing was when I got there, um, the coach said, "Well, I I, I want to meet your mom," and I'm like, "Oh, okay." Uh, so my mom shows up and, uh, he says, you know, I have to tell you, he says, I've never seen a highlight tape where I hear the fan. There's one fan cheering in the background. And I'm like, I'm like, oh my God, I'm mortified because here my mom was on these tapes going, woo, 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 like (laughs) screaming and yelling at the top of her lungs. And and he had never watched a highlight tape from a from a, an athlete where you had the mom in the background actually cheering him on. Now, now, okay. So fast forward twenty years later, and I'm thinking, I really appreciate that, right? Because there is somebody who my mom who was celebrating her love of sports, and granted, her her son was out running up and down the court, you know, shooting some hoops, and um, 
but but to kind of celebrate that love of sports and showing what it means to be a positive sports fan was really what it was all about. I, that's a great. I think that's a great uh, feel good way to wrap this up and an example that how an example of how family and sports connect and how they can Aww. how sports can connect mom. family members. My Talking grandma is a huge <laughs> mm-hmm. Warriors fan right oh, now, no. and she text messaged me trash talk. <laughs> My my grandma is a Warriors fan, and we got her a Steph Curry jersey last year, and she wears it all the time now. So my grandma is rocking a Steph Curry Warriors jersey. My, you know what? You know, there's the only re- one reason why my wife Mary Beth watches uh th- this is watching this series. I mean, she she likes the Cavs, but her father's name is James Curry. So she saw LeBron James and Steph Curry standing next to each other with their backs to the camera. And she said, oh, that's my dad. This was like three years ago. She says, oh, that's my dad's name, James Curry. And it was, it, no, okay, so this is the weird part, right? It was right around the same time that he passed away. So he passed away in the summer three years ago. And she saw that. And, and now because of that, like she's got this fixation on watching the cat. And so, you know, this is the third third year in a row, right? Now she's now she's obsessed with it. It's, it's pretty interesting. Unfortunately, uh, I'm a Cleveland fan, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I, you know, I, I hope the Cavs do well. Um, and if they don't, Jordan, I won't hate your grandma. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, my grandma's gonna be really pumped if the Warriors win. You know what I tell Cavs fans all the time. You know, we won it last year, uh, but you know, just imagine all of these other teams around the country who are sitting at home. Imagine all these other cities around the country who have professional sports teams who, all, like in many ways, like Cleveland, who never win. Uh, but at least we had last year. <laughs> yeah, that's that's There's how... always last year. <laughs> There's always last. And and and, and, and when yeah. this is over, if it ends positively, you know, good. But if not, we can always say there is always next year. We're back to that yep. again. Cleveland <laughs> Cleveland fans are used to that. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, I think this was great. Thank you so much for yeah, coming on. Thank you very Anytime, much. Anytime, guys. My pleasure. And I, I look forward to listening to the rest of your podcast. Oh, we appreciate it. Thank you. If you like what you've heard today and want to support the podcast, follow us on Twitter at Think Twice Pod and like us on Facebook at Think Twice. And check out our website thinktwicepodcast.com. And we could absolutely use your support. Please visit patreon.com slash thinktwice to view subscription options. For as little as $5 a month, you can support our work. $5. That's one cup of coffee a month. Thank you.